adding some spacing using CSS can be really confusing. There's the padding, the margin, or just setting the element size manually. If you have encountered the same problem before, don't worry. In this video, I'll go through what exactly the CSS box model is, as well as how to use it with actual real world examples, so you know when and where to use what. To start, let's first look at the content, which is the first part of the box model. The dimensions of the content is determined automatically by the browser. For example, if we have a button with some text, its dimension is determined by the text and things such as its font size to ensure that the text fits within the button. We can override this initial size using the width and height property. For example, we can increase its width and this will increase the initial width of the content within our box model. The next part of the box model is the padding. Padding allows us to add white space around the content. For example, if we give our button here a padding of 10 pixels on all sides, what this does is that it adds spacing around our content of 10 pixels on all sides. And since our button has a background color, we can see this visually. You might be wondering, why not just increase the width and height instead of using padding? For example, what if we found out that the width is 100 pixels and we just increased it to 120 pixels to account for the white spacing on both sides? And we then do something similar for the height. Although that is a possibility, the advantage of using padding here is that it's much easier to use than manually computing the width and height. Could you imagine if you had to recalculate the width and height every time you change the font size of our button? And with setting the width and height manually, there's a chance that the content could overflow out of the container if it exceeds the width. But with padding, that is not a possibility. So hopefully you're starting to see why this can be really useful. This is why when you're trying to add white space around some content, use padding. It increases the width around the content automatically and uses the same background color. On the other hand, you should set the width and height of the element manually if you want to set it to a fixed size. Now there are a few different ways to add padding. The first one we saw was just using one value. For example, to add a padding of 10 pixels on all sides, we use padding 10 pixels. This means 10 pixels on all sides. But what if we wanted to instead specify different values for different sides? The way that we do that is by specifying additional values. If we specify two values, for example, using padding 10 pixels, 20 pixels, this means 10 pixels on the top and bottom, and 20 pixels on the left and right. We can also use three values such as padding 10 pixels, 20 pixels and 30 pixels. This means 10 pixels on the top, 20 pixels on the right, 30 pixels on the bottom, and 20 pixels on the left. And lastly, if we specify all four values, for example, padding 10 pixels, 20 pixels, 30 pixels, and 40 pixels, then this will mean 10 pixels on the top, 20 pixels on the right, 30 pixels on the bottom, and 40 pixels on the left. This can be any values, I've just used different values here as an example. Having the option to specify padding values for different sides can be freely useful. For most interfaces, the first two are the most common. If you just want the same amount of white space for a piece of content, being able to do it with just one value makes it simple. There are also many cases where you want to specify different values of white spacing vertically and horizontally, which is where the second one can be useful. The other two can definitely be useful as well as they give you more control. The last one giving you the most control but they aren't used as often. Alright, now that you've seen why they are useful, how exactly do you remember them? Well, they actually all follow a really simple pattern. For the second method of adding padding, we start at the top and use the first value. We then go clockwise and use the second value as the right padding. Next, we go clockwise once more, but this time we have no more values to use, so we use the value opposite of it and use that value. We then go clockwise again, and since we have no more values as well, we use the value opposite of it. For the third method of adding padding, this works just the same. We start at the top and use the first value. Going clockwise, we use the second value as the right padding, and the same occurs for the bottom padding. When we run out of values to use for the left padding, we then use the same padding as the right padding since it is opposite of it. This idea also applies to the last method, only that no values are missing. 
So in general, you just go clockwise and use the values as needed. But if any values are missing, just use the value of the side opposite of it. Let's take a look at our first example. Say we wanted to create a simple block layout and we'll focus on designing it for desktops, which requires adding some white space, such as within the navigation bar and within the buttons. To start, I've already created the starter code and added some initial styling so that we can focus on adding white space using the padding and later on using other parts of the box model. You can follow along by using this code pen, which I'll link in the description below. It allows you to easily follow and code along in your browser. Alternatively, you can also find the starter code and images needed within this GitHub link, which I also include. Let's first add some white space around our navigation bar. Within the HTML, it has a tag name of header. So we will use that header selector within the style sheet. Let's say we want to add a padding of 50 pixels on all sides. Can you remember how we specify the same padding on all sides? It's by using padding 50 pixels. Besides that, the main content of our layout could also use some white space. For this, since all of the article's content is within the main tag within the HTML, I'll use the selector. And let's say we want that 50 pixels of padding on the top and bottom, but 200 pixels on the left and right. We can add that by using padding 50 pixels, 200 pixels as we saw earlier. Feel free to try different values and also know that these values don't have to just be in pixels. They can be any other CSS values such as percentages, M's or grams and such. In fact, we could also use a percentage of the view ports width for the padding on the left and right, such as 20 VW. If you haven't seen this CSS unit before, it means 20% of the viewport width. This means the left and right padding will always be 20% of the viewports width each. And that's just an alternative to using pixels so that the padding can be relative to the user's screen size. Lastly, let's add some padding to the related post container that we have here. Both of them use the class name of related post. So we will use the selector within the style sheet. Try pausing and adding the padding you believe is most suitable for this part. There isn't any exact or correct answer to this. Usually you want to stay consistent with the rest of the layout. And from my experimenting, 50 pixels on all sides seems to work well here. So I'll add a padding of 50 pixels. Now, something you might have noticed is that it seems like the browser already has some default styling. For example, this button already has some padding added to it. If I inspect it, Chrome provides a visual representation of the CSS box model, which can be really useful for debugging problems. And we can see that there is a padding of 1 pixel on the top and bottom, as well as 6 pixels on both sides. This isn't something that I've added within the style sheet, it's something added by the browser by default. We can choose to use this default padding or override it by providing our own within our style sheet. I will override it and add some padding to this button. 15 pixels on the top and bottom and 50 pixels on the left and right seems to work well here. Feel free to experiment with other values to get a better feel for how it affects our layout. Alright, now that we are comfortable with using padding, let's move on to the third layer of the CSS box model and that is the border. The border sits outside of the padding and is usually used to just improve the aesthetics of our layout. With the border, we can change the size, color and style of it. For example, let's look at the same button. If we wanted to add a simple solid border around it, we can specify like so. A border of 5 pixels solid red. This will create a solid 5 pixel with red border on all sides outside of our padding. And if we have no padding, then the border is placed around of our content. Here we can see that we have three main options for changing the border. First, we have the width 5 pixels in this case. This is the width of the border. We also have the style of the border. Solid creates a border field using the color we give it. But there are also other options such as dotted and dashed. I'll leave a link in the description which you can use as a reference for all of the possible styles. 
but you almost never need to use anything else except for a solid border since basically everything else doesn't fit into a modern layout. The last value we have here is the color of the border. This can be any value for specifying a color such as a hex or RGB color code. In this case, I've just specified the word for the color since it is also a possible color value that has been predefined. Also note that the order which they are specified in does matter, the width should come first, then the style and lastly the color. You can easily look this up if you ever forget it. You might now be wondering when you will want to add a border to your elements. Borders are actually used too often if you look at the websites, but generally they can be used to visually separate out different parts of a layout or to create outline buttons for example. Let's implement some of them within our blog article layout. Right now, our related post container looks really bland and boring. One way to quickly make it stand out to the user is to add a simple border to one of the sides. For example, within the selector for the related post container, I will add a red colored border only to the left side. We can add a border to just one side instead of all sides, like so, using border dash left. I'll make it 10 pixels with a solid style and I'll use the same red color as the rest of the layout, which I'll copy the color code from. If we want to add the border to just one side, there is also the possibility to add it just to the right, top or bottom. Once again, I would highly encourage you to experiment with different values for the width and style for the border. To create an outline button within the HTML, I've given it this related post button class name, so we will use it within our style sheet. And we can simply give it a border of 2 pixels solid. I will also reuse this dark blue color here. This creates the outline of the button. We can then remove the background color and set it to transparent. I will also change the color of the text to the same dark blue color. And now we have this outline button. So there's another use case of using borders. The last thing I'll mention here about borders is the border radius property. This is used to create rounded corners within elements. We can do this by specifying border dash radius 30 pixels for example and this will make all elements corner rounded by 30 pixels on all four corners. The border radius property can take in any CSS value but usually you use either percentages or pixels. If it is specified as a percentage for example 20% then this will give us a border radius of 20% of the width and height respectively. In general, you should use rounded corners within your website if you want to make it seem fun and approachable. But you should stick with short corners if you want to make it seem well established, reputable or sophisticated. Coming back to our example, let's make this article image rounded. I've given it a class name of article-img. So within our style sheet where it is selected, we can give it a border radius, say 16 pixels to make it have rounded corners. Within this selector, we have selected the container for the related post and also give it the same border radius to make it rounded as well. And we also give the image within the related post container the same border radius, which you can do within the selector. Once again, I would highly encourage you to try different values. And now with the rounded corners added, this helps make our layout looks more friendly and approachable to the user. Note that just like adding padding, if you specify one value, it will affect all of the corners. But what if we instead wanted different values for different corners? For that, we can specify two values. The first value affects the top left corner. Going clockwise, the second affects the top right corner. The bottom right corner will take the value opposite of it, and so will the bottom left corner. This works in a similar way for specifying three values.
and we can specify all four values separately as well. This works just like adding the padding. Within our example, we can also do it for the button. But this time, try experimenting with different values. For example, we can specify 16 pixels for the top left and bottom right corner and 32 pixels for the top right and bottom left corner. And that just helps to change the style of our button by changing how its corners are being rounded. Previously, we saw that within the box model, the padding is used to add spacing within an element. But what if instead wanted to add spacing outside of an element? For that, we can use the margin property. This allows us to add spacing around an element. For example, if we specify the margin of 10 pixels to both sides of our articles here, do you have 10 pixels or spacing outside of them on all sides? Don't worry if this is slightly confusing, we will take a look at an example of how we can use margin in a moment. Although the padding and margin are pretty similar and can sometimes be interchangeable, you mainly want to stick with using margin to add spacing outside an element, as it will not extend the background color. Padding on the other hand is used for adding spacing within an element, and it will extend the background color. Once again, like with adding border radius or padding, we can specify multiple values for the margin. If we specify one value, it is used as the margin around the entire element on all four sides. If we specify two values, the first value will use as the margin on the top, and the second is used as the margin on the right. Going clockwise, the third has no value, so it uses the value opposite of it, and same goes for the fourth. If we specify three values, the first value is used as the top margin, the second as the margin on the right, and the third as the margin on the bottom. Going clockwise, the next side doesn't have any value, so it uses the one opposite of it as well. For all four values, each side's margin can be individually specified. One quick example, if we look back to our article layout, we can see that there is already some margin added by default by our browser within the heading. If we inspect the document and look within the dev tools. If we instead want to add more margin, we can specify our want to override the default within the selector for the H1 tag. For example, margin of 60 pixels and 0 pixels. This will add 60 pixels on the top and bottom and 0 pixels on the left and right. Feel free to try different values, such as if we added more margin, then there's more spacing around the heating element. Just to quickly recap, the first part of the CSS box model is the content. Its width and height can be set by us, or if not, it will be set automatically based on the content. The second is the padding. This is used to set the spacing within an element, usually used to add white space. Next, we have the border, which can be used to add a border around our elements. When setting the border, we can set the width of the border such as 10 pixels or any other CSS value. We can also set the style of the border, usually this is set to solid, and the color of the border, which can be any CSS color value such as a hex code or an RGB color code. We can also make the corners of our elements rounded by using the border radius property. The last is the margin, which is used to set the spacing outside of an element. There is also the option to specify different values of margin on different sides, and to do that, we can specify multiple values for the margin. So, whenever you're having trouble figuring out which property to use to add spacing with CSS, Imagine all of the elements consisting of their own individual box models and think back to what each property within the box model does with the help of this video to better understand which CSS property you should use. Next, let's look at some common problems you come across when working with the CSS box model. The first is the box sizing. 
for that, let's look at this newsletter subscription component, which I've already done most of the styling for. I've given it a width of 80 view width, so we will take out exactly 80% of the entire viewport's width. Now, if we wanted to add some pattern within the element, for example, 50 pixels on the top and bottom, and 100 pixels on the left and right, we expect that this container will still take out the width that I've given it, which is exactly 80% of the viewport width here. But what actually happens when we add padding here is that the padding is added on top of that 80%. So our container's width is now more than 80% of the viewport's width. This may not be obvious, but if I added more padding to the left and right side, such as if I added 400 pixels instead of 100 pixels, then we can clearly see that the new slab element here is more than 80% of the viewport's width. I'll change it back to 100 pixels. Now this wasn't an issue with the other elements we saw since we didn't give them a specific width. But it is now since we have given it a fixed width, which is something that you may sometimes need to do if you want to set a fixed size for your elements. So the problem that we have here is that by default, the actual width of an element is going to be the width we have specified, plus any padding, border or margin we give it. They will all be added to the actual width. Usually this behavior is in one we one If we specify a width of 400 pixels, for example, we expect that the total width will always be 400 pixels. This can cause many unexpected problems and can cause your elements to overflow if you don't take this into consideration. The way that we avoid this is by changing the element's box sizing property. The default value of the box sizing property is content box for all of the elements which as we saw calculates its total width by the width that it is given plus the width of any padding, border or margin if there are any. To fix this, we can change the box sizing property to be border box. Using border box instead, the element's actual width will always be the width we specify it to be. Even if we add padding or borders to it, they will always be accounted for in the actual width. So the actual element's width will always be the width we have given it. Coming back to our example, if we change the box sizing property within our newsletter container element here, we can see that now, even if we give it a large size for the padding, it will always use the same width of 80% of the viewport's width that we have given it. And the total width will always account for any extra padding or border that we have given it. Do note that if we give it a margin, it will not be included in the element's total width though. If we give it a margin, it will be added to that element's actual width. The last topic we will go over here is the CSS reset. As we saw, some parts of the CSS box model has default values set by the browser. For example, the button had a pattern of 1 pixel on the top and bottom and 6 pixels on the left and right. This can be convenient, but can also pose a few problems. For one, when creating a site, it is not obvious which elements have these default values, which makes it difficult to debug. For example, if I added an image to a brand new document, we can see that there is some spacing on the top and left hand side. If you then wanted to remove the spacing, you'll probably start by checking if the image has any padding or margin added to it, since either could be causing the white space, since the image doesn't have any background color. But it seems like there isn't any within the image. Next, we can look at the body element. It's the body that acts an extra margin. So if we reset it to zero, then that spacing is removed. This might seem like a small problem, but imagine building a larger site where there are a multitude of elements affecting each other. In that case, trying to find where that extra spacing is being added by default and causing the issue can be a pain. So what is commonly done is to use a CSS reset where at the top of our style sheet we select all elements and set their padding and margin to zero. The asterisk symbol here selects all elements within our style sheet. So this styling is being applied to all of the elements within our document. And if we then add any padding or margin later on, then they will override this default value of zero that we've given it. 
another reason for using this CSS reset is that on older browsers the default values can be different which is why setting it all to zero and then adding the margin and padding as we need later on is preferred. That's why it's called the CSS reset because it resets everything to a value initially and we then override it as needed instead of relying on the browser to give us that default and also so that we do not run into any unexpected problems when dealing with the spacing of our elements. Lastly, since we usually also want the box sizing to be set to border box instead of content box which is the default, we also typically see that when added to the CSS reset so that the box sizing is automatically set to the border box for all of the elements and we do not have to set them manually for the elements when we need them. There are other forms of CSS reset that affect other properties. I'll link a resource in the description below. But for the most part, especially for small and medium sized projects, using this simple CSS reset at the top of your style sheet every time will save you from having a headache. Besides that, that is all for this video. This video took a long time to create. If you have found it useful or helpful, you'll probably also be interested in this video about Flexbox, which will make it much easier to create layouts with CSS. Please also consider liking and subscribing to my channel for more of such content.